Um, hi, everyone. So uh, this is uh, our last talk of the spring session. So again, uh, this talk series are given by the awardees of NCU Delta Young Astronomer Lectureship, which was founded by the National Central University and Delta Electronics Foundation to recognize young scholars who have made outstanding contributions in this field. So each year, the new awardee will be invited to Taiwan to give talks and interact with us. So the original plan was to invite all of, uh, all of the previous awardees to, to come back to Taiwan, but you know, unfortunately, uh, we have to make this event online due to the pandemic. So our speaker today is Professor Shen Yue from uh, UIUC. So Professor Shen received this award in 2018. And I think he's a world expert in quasars and supermassive black holes. And I think, I believe he works on a lot of topics and a lot of things you know, related to these fascinating objects, such as their, you know, their physics, how they evolve with time and how they interact with the host galaxies. So, you know, it's our great pleasure to have him here. So the title of his talk today is the Galactic Scale Supermassive Black Hole Pairs at uh, Cosmic Moon. So just a few announcements here. Uh, please mute yourself during the talk. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please uh, leave them in the chat box. We will come back to those questions later or you know, during the Q&A session. All right, uh, Professor Shen, I'll let you take this away. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Uh, and also thanks for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to be here again in this uh, virtual mode to talk about uh, a topic that I have been working on for the past few years. Uh, and I choose this topic uh, 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 because, uh, well, first of all, it's interesting, uh, but also, uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, uh, there's uh, a lot of efforts uh, led by uh, students from Taiwan, uh, uh, in particular, uh, Yuqing and Xiangzhi. Uh, so they have been uh, playing a, a, a major role uh, in uh, uh, you know, carrying out the uh, uh, observational program and performing uh, data reduction and analysis and also uh, uh, writing up uh, publications. So the topic is about galactic scale supermassive black hole pairs. So that's not just one supermassive black hole, but uh, uh, two uh, at cosmic noon, which is uh, around redshift of uh, uh, 1.5 or two. I'll get uh, to that later. Um, I, I do want to mention that um, a, um, uh, a Zoom talk uh, is uh, often uh, awkward uh, because I cannot see the questions posted on the chat. Uh, so uh, if Yan Chen, you see any uh, uh, questions there, uh, you know, feel free to, to uh, interrupt me uh, and uh, 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 sort of give me some feedback so we can uh, uh, you know, have a uh, uh, more interesting uh, discussion uh, on some of the uh, uh, discussions, uh, questions. Sure. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so let me get started. Uh, oh, I would just say that um, uh, first I will give you some uh, basic background of this topic. Uh, and then I will go, uh, dive into some specifics, some details uh, of uh, uh, supermassive black hole pairs uh, and why they are interesting uh, and what we already know and what's uh, uh, missing uh, in, the, in the grand picture. Uh, and then I will present uh, some of our own uh, uh, latest work, uh, and uh, I will end with a, uh, a sort of positive outlook uh, where this is going uh, and why do I believe uh, why uh, that uh, uh, we will have a definitive answer uh, to some of those questions related to this topic in a few years. Okay, so uh, let's uh, get into it. All right, so I'd like to start with uh, some uh, eye candy first. Uh, so uh, this is a uh, uh, simulation, uh, cosmological uh, hydrodynamic simulation uh, taken from the Elytris project. Um, and uh, the purpose of showing this simulation is to show that uh, we live in a hierarchical universe. So structures build up uh, from uh, bottom to up. Uh, the smaller structures form first and they, uh, they uh, merge uh, to and combine to become larger uh, and larger structures um, and uh, throughout the history of the universe. Uh, so what's shown here, uh, the end product at a ratio of zero is a giant ape of galaxies. So it's a dead and red galaxy. 
but what we've seen in this animation shows the evolution of the formation history of this giant elliptical uh, from high redshift. So you can see that as time goes on, uh, smaller and smaller galaxies uh, shown uh, on the left as a starlight and on the right are, uh, are the distributions of gas. So the giant elliptical gas at redshift zero is built up by the mergers of many, many smaller uh, galaxies. Most of them are spiral galaxies uh, in early times. Uh, and as you can see that when uh, some of when two or multiple spiral galaxies emerge, then they undergo uh, not only morphological changes, but also the merger is triggering violent uh, star formation to form new stars. Uh, and uh, the individual stars formed earlier will eventually become the ingredients of the uh, final uh, giant elliptical galaxy. So the details of this simulation are not important. And the, the important message here is that uh, galaxy mergers happen very frequently uh, in the universe. And in particular in the early universe when the specific merger rate per galaxy is much higher than uh, it's, uh, the merger rate at the local universe. All right, so uh, the other side of my story uh, concerns the supermassive black holes at the center of uh, galaxies. Well, let's uh, be more specific, uh, the, at the center of a massive galaxy, because we don't really know if uh, small dwarf galaxies always have, also have a supermassive black hole at its center. So for several decades now, astronomers have come to the realization that uh, the existence of uh, supermassive black holes uh, at galactic centers uh, is quite you know, ubiquitous. Um, and this is done through uh, demographic studies of nearby dormant galaxies. Uh, and when they look into the central regions of those dormant galaxies, they find dynamical evidence that there must be a very compact and very massive dark object in the center because the stellar orbits around them are, uh, tends to be uh, uh, moving very, very fast. And it's not just that, uh, there is also a remarkable correlation between the mass of these dark objects, which are called supermassive black holes, and the properties of uh, the, uh, the host galaxies. For example, the uh, potential, the gravitational potential of the galaxy, you know, the stellar mass or the uh, stellar velocity dispersion of the bulge of that galaxy. So this is famously known as the, uh, the correlation between black hole mass and the uh, galaxy properties, or uh, one of them is called the M-sigma relation. Which is shown here, the y-axis is the uh, black hole mass and the x-axis is the, uh, the stellar velocity dispersion. So you can see over several orders of magnitude in black hole mass, uh, then there is a uh, correlation. Uh, it's kind of strange because uh, the region that uh, can be affected gravitationally by the black hole uh, is tiny. Uh, it's only on the order of 10 parsecs compared to the size of the galaxy. So the reason we're seeing a correlation here over many orders of magnitude in mass is telling you something, uh, perhaps there is a causal link between the growth of the supermassive black hole uh, and the, uh, the formation of stars in the host galaxy. So if we uh, uh, kind of uh, look at uh, the, uh, our backyard, uh, then the closest supermassive black hole to us is of course the, the, uh, the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And uh, this is actually one of the black, supermassive black holes for which we can precisely measure its mass. Uh, it's about 4 million times the mass of the sun. And this is uh, made possible by monitoring the orbits of individual stars around the center of the Milky Way. Uh, if you have enough spatial resolution uh, with uh, you know, AO imaging, you can actually pinpoint, see through the, the, the dust and the heavy extension of the optical towards the galactic center and see the uh, orbits of individual stars over years uh, around a central uh, dark object marked by this uh, uh, this uh, 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 this star here, um, and based on the orbits of uh, these stars uh, and applying some uh, Newtonian dynamics uh, with some GR correction, you, we can measure uh, the uh, mass of that essential dark object here, uh, and to be uh, uh, roughly four million uh, solar masses. Okay, so uh, but. Until uh, at this point, the first two images here is telling you that while well, there are supermassive black holes at the center of uh, 
galaxies. But uh, those are based on dynamical evidence that, that uh, the motions of stars or gas uh, are surrounding uh, that essential object uh, 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 are so fast. So it has to be a very massive uh, black hole there. But seeing is believing. So uh, this is why it's important. It's, it's amazing to see the first direct image of a supermassive black hole uh, in the nearby giant elliptical galaxy M87 uh, about a few years ago. I believe it's in 2019 when the Event Horizon Telescope project uh, released as their first direct image or first portrait of a supermassive black hole in M87. And what it is seen here is uh, an incredibly small region, compact region uh, in the center of that M87 galaxy. Uh, and you can see that there is a bright ring surrounding a kind of central shadow area. And that uh, black spot in the middle is called the black hole shadow. Uh, and that's the, uh, the shadow cast by the black hole onto the surrounding uh, accretion below. So the black hole at M87 uh, is not entirely dormant. Uh, it is accreting very tenuous uh, gas onto it. And this tenuous accretion flow is producing that glow you see in this orange bright color. Uh, and by measuring the size of that ring, it's called the uh, photon ring, uh, you can infer the mass uh, of that black hole, the event horizon uh, as well. Uh, and they agree with the uh, measurement of the black hole mass measured from the stellar kinematics. Okay, so the size of the photon ring in this M87 black hole uh, uh, is about the size of the solar system. Uh, and that gives you a rough estimate of the mass of about uh, several billion times the mass of the sun. So it's a gigantic black hole uh, in the heart of M87. So what about the Milky Way center black hole? So just a few days ago, the Event Horizon Telescope, I'm sure that uh, you guys have heard of the news. Uh, it made such a blast across the internet. So this is the first portrait of the Milky Way Center uh, supermassive black hole, this 4 million uh, solar mass black hole. Uh, so you can see that, uh, uh, you can still see that uh, the central uh, black hole shadow surrounded by uh, this photon ring. Uh, the geometry looks a little bit different and uh, the locations of those bright spots also kind of different, differ from what we see in the M87 uh, black hole image. Um, but the incredible thing about this is that this Milky Way center black hole has a, uh, has a mass that is uh, three orders of magnitude smaller than uh, the black hole in M87. So now we actually have two portraits for two very different black holes in size, uh, but they are both uh, supermassive black holes. So the bottom line is uh, massive black holes are ubiquitous at the center of uh, massive galaxies. So, uh, so here are our facts. Galaxies merge uh, frequently in the universe, um, and we also expect uh, supermassive black holes are common at the center of individual galaxies. If you combine those two facts, uh, then there is an al almost inevitable consequences, consequence that uh, the formation of uh, pairs of supermassive black holes is uh, uh, nearly inevitable. So that comes to uh, the uh, topic of my talk, uh, supermassive black hole pairs. But first I want to uh, give you some ideas why this topic is uh, important and why we want to study uh, supermassive black hole pairs at all, uh, even though they are expected in the universe. So uh, the first thing to note is that uh, studying supermassive black hole pairs is uh, very useful if we, uh, if we want to understand the uh, assembly history of uh, supermassive black holes uh, through cosmic history. Uh, so if we look at the, uh, the history of the universe in terms of activities, that is the activity of star formation and the activity of uh, uh, supermassive black hole accretion, uh, then there's an interesting uh, uh, a plot uh, shown here uh, uh, telling you that uh, both the uh, star formation activity globally uh, and the quasar activity, that is the accretion of uh, uh, the most massive supermassive black holes, they tend to uh, rise as you go back in time and they peak around a redshift around two and then they kind of decline towards higher uh, redshifts. 
So array ratio of two is the so-called cost per noon. So that is uh, both the global star formation uh, rate and the uh, quiz activity reached their peak, uh, or it reaches their prime epoch. Uh, so the left panel shows uh, the evolution of the uh, star formation rate density. So that's uh, in a given volume, what is the star formation rate? Uh, how many solar masses per year? And you can see that uh, those data points are fit by some uh, uh, smooth function and peak around the redshift of two. And this is famously known as the, uh, the Madal plot. Uh, in a similar spirit, you can plot the, uh, the evolution of the density of the uh, most luminous quasars. So those are the supermassive black holes that are accreting uh, most uh, 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 intensively uh, in the universe. Uh, and if you do that, and this is taken from the uh, luminosity function uh, work uh, using SDS as the data, and you find that uh, the peak activity of quasar accretion uh, also is around the ratio of two. So it's kind of a conspiracy that both star formation and uh, supermassive black hole growth happen at the same time, and the entire evolution as a function of time are kind of uh, roughly tracing each other. So if you recall the tight correlation between black hole mass and host gas properties, then it's possible that uh, the growth of massive black holes in the host galaxies uh, is kind of in a uh, uh, synchronized uh, and provide uh, not only the same evolution uh, across cosmic time, but also the, uh, the same similar correlation that we observe locally as the type M sigma relation. So uh, the uh, cosmic noon uh, is where merger activity uh, is much higher uh, compared to the local universe. So we expect lots of galaxy mergers and therefore we expect this is the primary uh, uh, epoch where uh, the formation of uh, supermassive by hope pairs uh, uh, is also uh, at its prime. Now, if you, can, if you have a galaxy merger, and you have two massive black holes uh, to become a pair, the success of evolution of this pair inside this emerging galaxy uh, poses a lot of interesting theoretical uh, problems. So this cartoon here shows uh, the several stages, uh, important stages of the evolution of supermassive black hole pairs following a galaxy merger. And during those different stages, uh, there are different physical processes operating uh, and uh, contributing to the evolution uh, of the pair. That is how the orbit uh, is shrinking over time. So I'll get down to details of this orbit evolution later, but eventually uh, we expect that those two black holes will become so close that they will, the evolution will be dominated by uh, gravitational wave radiation. And uh, in the end, uh, uh, ultimately those two black holes will uh, merge to become a single black hole, and then it will have a burst of gravitational wave radiation energy that hopefully that we can be, uh, uh, we can be measuring uh, in the next uh, decade or next uh, uh, few decades. So studying supermassive black hole pairs is important because while those pairs are at uh, larger separations, they're not the final stage of the merger, uh, but they are set the important initial conditions of how many uh, black hole mergers you expect. Uh, and therefore, uh, by quantifying the statistics of those uh, galactic scale uh, supermassive black hole pairs, hopefully we can construct a better uh, forecast uh, and better predictions of uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, gravitational waves from uh, this uh, mergers of these two black holes. Um, and I think uh, when speaking about gravitational waves, uh, this is the uh, uh, really exciting frontier. Uh, we know that astronomy is uh, once again at, at an important crossroad uh, where the traditional uh, astronomy in the electromagnetic uh, domain uh, is embracing this, uh, uh, this new era of multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, and uh, we have detected gravitational waves uh, from the mergers of uh, stellar compact objects and is, uh, we're eagerly waiting for the first detection of uh, the gravitational waves uh, from the mergers of the most massive compact object in the, in the universe, and that is uh, supermassive black hole mergers. So uh, because the massive black holes, those supermassive black holes are so massive, you know, there are millions of solar masses or billions of solar masses massive, 
Uh, and when they merge, it's so big, when they merge, uh, the gravitational sirens they produce are actually in the very low frequency uh, regime, that is you know, in the nan nanohertz regime uh, or the uh, millihertz regime, between nanohertz and millihertz, depending on how massive uh, those two black holes are. And uh, those uh, low frequency gravitational waves uh, can be detected uh, by ongoing projects uh, as well as uh, uh, upcoming uh, projects. For example, the pulsar timing array uh, is an ongoing project trying to detect the mergers, the gravitational waves from the mergers of the most massive supermassive black holes, so kind of billion mass, uh, solar mass black holes. And on the other hand, in uh, maybe 10, 15 years from now, uh, the space-based interferometers like LISA uh, will hopefully be able to detect the uh, gravitational sirens from the mergers, uh, the, the final chip of the mergers of uh, uh, million uh, solar mass uh, uh, binary black holes. So this is why it is so interesting when we talk about supermassive black hole pairs, uh, we anticipated that uh, the future evolution uh, will provide gravitational waves that can open our uh, another uh, another sense to study the universe and to understand how uh, the, uh, uh, the those most uh, exotic objects in the universe are formed. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, the uh, it's important to study supermassive black hole pairs uh, because it may also help us to constrain the nature of dark matter. So we know that the cold dark matter paradigm is quite successful uh, in modern day cosmology, but there are problems. Uh, you probably have heard of some of the problems, for example, the missing satellite problem or the uh, too big to fail problem. You don't have to know the details of the problem, but just know that there are problems with the CDM uh, paradigm. So astronomers like to solve this problem, these various problems with uh, baryonic physics. So you put in some feedback from baryonic matter like supernovae or Asian feedback, then somehow you can uh, solve uh, those uh, missing pieces uh, in the CDM uh, universe. Uh, particle physicists like to solve the problem in a different approach. That is, it can propose different candidates for dark matter. For example, uh, fuzzy dark matter uh, is one of the uh, uh, proposed alternatives to uh, the cold dark matter particles. So the fuzzy dark matter particles are those ultra light boson particles. Um, and because they are so light, their mass is like 10 to the minus 22 electrovolts. Their deployed wavelength is insanely long. It's like kiloparsec long in their deployed wavelengths. That means that uh, those waves can actually interact with each other on dialectic scales. So in addition to the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, impact of those very long wave dark matter fluctuations uh, to solve the other CDM problems, there's also a, a, an interesting prediction from uh, fuzzy dark matter that uh, it will inhibit the decay of uh, supermassive black hole pairs uh, to below, much below the deployed wavelengths, which is one kiloparsec. Uh, because these uh, uh, wave perturbations on kiloparsec scales will keep pumping energy into the orbit of those, bi of those uh, supermassive black hole pair and just keep them uh, with that separation. So you might expect a pile up of uh, pairs of supermassive black holes at this characteristic scale of one kiloparsec. And if we do obs observe such a pair up of uh, SMBH pairs, then that could be the smoking gun of the uh, existence of uh, fuzzy dark matter. Okay, so that's kind of my very uh, long introduction of uh, uh, setting up the, uh, uh, the stage uh, for the background. Now I'd like to spend some time to dive into uh, some details of the orbital evolution of uh, a supermassive black hole pair following a galaxy merger. So this is a cartoon again, showing you uh, when the two black holes within their own galaxies, uh, when the two galaxies merge and become one, then those two black holes uh, will uh, evolve, uh, their orbit will evolve, and they will go around each other in the merged galaxy. And through a process called dynamical friction, between those black holes and stars, uh, their orbit will decay from a tenth of a kiloparsec to a, a tenth of a parsec, okay? So the physical process of this dynamic friction is very simple. Uh, you basically have a sea of stars in the galaxy and the massive black hole is like a perturber 
uh, and when it travels through the sea of uh, stars at high speed, uh, it will leave behind a wake of perturbations. So as you can see that the stars falling behind uh, this moving black hole uh, will be attracted towards the center and it will cause a temporary enhancement of density behind the traveling supermassive black hole. And therefore gives it a pull, uh, a backwards uh, 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 force to slow down this moving supermassive black hole. So it's like a gravitational drag. So as a black hole travels through this sea of stars, it will constantly experience this uh, dynamical drag of stars uh, through dynamical friction. So that will reduce the orbit of this pair of supermassive black holes uh, because those drag will lose and uh, will reduce angular momentum of the individual uh, uh, supermassive black hole. So once the separation becomes uh, say around a few parsec or 10 parsec, then the gravity from the black holes themselves becomes important, more important than the gravity uh, potential from uh, the collective uh, stars in the galaxy. So at this point, we call these two, uh, this pair of supermassive black holes becomes a bound uh, binary supermassive black holes. So they're bound by their own gravity. So at this stage, dynamic friction uh, is no longer uh, the dominant mechanism to shrink the orbit. Uh, instead, the dominant mechanism is uh, interactions of this binary supermassive black hole with uh, individual stars that come very close to their binary orbit. Okay. Now, now this bound binary has a separation of about 10 parsec. So that's actually a, a, in the very center of the galaxy. So in order uh, for the stars, individual stars, to get close enough to this binary orbit and uh, extract further angular momentum and energy from the bound binary, you basically require those stars to be on nearly radial orbits, right? They nearly, they're basically traveling all the way to the center, very center of the galaxy to be close enough uh, uh, to this binary supermassive black hole. So this process is called, you know, uh, the interaction or uh, ejection of stars through, uh, uh, it's like a three body problem. You eject stars and you lose angular momentum. So the uh, uh, the binary can continue to shrink the orbit. If the binary somehow can shrink to small enough separations, say less than uh, a milliparsec, then then is the uh, the regime where gravitational radiation will become dominant. It will carry away uh, angular momentum and energy more efficiently than interactions with uh, with uh, stars on radial orbits. Okay. Uh, but in order to get into that stage, uh, the mechanism uh, or the, you should supply enough stars on those nearly radial orbits in order to extract, in order to uh, uh, shrink the orbit of the binary to uh, much less than a parsec. Okay, so previous I was giving you this uh, uh, this ideas uh, uh, different ideas of the different stages and different physical processes. But observationally, what we want to observe is the uh, relative frequency of pairs at different separations, right? And the frequency of those pairs or the fraction of those pairs as a function of separation depends on the lifetime of that pair at these different stages. So in a classical paper in 1980, uh, Sebegelman et al. They, uh, formulated the problem and uh, uh, lay out the uh, groundwork for a theoretical understanding of uh, the evolution of a pair of supermassive black holes in galaxy mergers. So that, that gives you some quantitative estimate of the time scale or the lifetime uh, that this pair of supermassive black hole spans uh, at, at different stages, at different separations. So on galactic scales, you know, below tens of kiloparsec to hundreds of parsec, then dynamic friction uh, will uh, reduce the orbit of the pair. Uh, and that takes about, uh, you know, millions of years or maybe uh, hundreds of millions of years. And then uh, the scattering of stars uh, on radio orbits will uh, try to shrink the orbit further. But somehow, if uh, all the stars that can come close enough to the binary are already ejected, uh, then you've already consumed all the possible uh, individual stars and you're left with nothing to further interact with the, uh, the black hole uh, binary, but you're still not quite there yet. 
because gravitational radiation will only become efficient as you go down to this kind of a milliparsec regime. But now at around one parsec, you already depleted uh, all the possible stellar orbits that can uh, interact with this tight binary. So this is a infamously known as the final parsec problem. That is, imagine this scenario where you have depleted all the uh, radio orbits of stars in the galaxy. So the two, binary, the two black holes in the binary can no longer shrink their orbit separation. So you just store there. So that is a problem because they will never get into the gravitational radiation regime and not to mention that they will never uh, uh, merge with each other. So, uh, so that's a problem, but whenever there's a problem, there are multiple solutions. So a, a lot more and more people uh, have realized, uh, very quickly realized that those, this problem, the final passive problem, perhaps is not a problem per se, because uh, there are some assumptions in the original Begelman paper uh, that are probably unrealistic. For example, uh, they were assuming spherical geometry for this galaxy. Okay, so assuming this galaxy potential is uh, spherical. So spherical ge geometry is very strict. So that limits the, uh, the number of uh, stellar orbits that can come very close to the cent very center of the galaxy. Okay, so that's one uh, potential caveat of this uh, classical paper. Uh, and also, uh, uh, there are other effects that have not been taken into account seriously. For example, the effects of gas, uh, uh, if, if it's important, uh, uh, then they can effectively reduce the amount of time required to shrink this orbits into the gravitational radiation uh, regime. Anyways, uh, just to give you uh, some brief ideas of how people can solve these final passive problems with uh, uh, additional uh, theoretical uh, ideas, uh, 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 we can uh, uh, need to do some modifications of the original uh, uh, formalism uh, of the uh, 1980 paper. And the first modification is that uh, the two black holes are not a uh, single point masses. Instead, they are surrounded, they were surrounded by a very dense and compact uh, star clusters around them. And so initially, uh, these black holes and the individual star clusters kind of are moving as a whole. Uh, so their perturbable mass is much bigger than a black hole, uh, a single black hole. And therefore you experience a more effective dynamical friction drag. And then as the orbit of the, of the pair shrinks, uh, these dense star clusters will be stripped away uh, its envelope uh, further and further uh, due to tidal effects. Uh, and then eventually uh, those two black holes will become uh, naked, okay? But this uh, uh, detail here will change the relative frequency of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the pair on different separations because the dynamical friction time scale is modified. Uh, due to this uh, uh, additional uh, uh, reality here. So uh, Yu et al. in 2002 uh, did this experiment uh, and uh, uh, showed you the effect of uh, this uh, star cluster surrounding this naked black hole. So uh, uh, those different lines here represent different uh, details in the uh, galaxy uh, structures. Uh, but there are basically two groups of the evolution of the time scales as a function of separation of the pair. Uh, this top uh, group represents the simplest case where two black holes are naked. There is no star cluster surrounding them. And this lower group shows the results when uh, the black hole initially is surrounded by a dense star cluster and the star cluster gradually lose mass uh, as the uh, orbit of the pair uh, shrinks further and further in the potential of the merged galaxy. So as you can see that initially, uh, because of this density cluster, dense cluster around, uh, surrounding those black holes, uh, dynamical friction in fact is actually quite efficient. So it basically reduces the time scale of the lifetime spending on uh, tens of kiloparsecs to uh, hundreds of parsecs. Uh, and that brings, uh, uh, makes it faster uh, to uh, shrink those two uh, black holes. And the second effect is to consider more realistic potential of the galaxy. So if the galaxy is non spherical, then you can have more stars filling the lost cone, can come close enough to interact with the binary. And indeed, when you do that, you find that 
uh, it can effectively uh, reduce or even eliminate this final plastic problem. So this figure here shows the evolution uh, of uh, uh, the a pair of uh, superintensive black holes on the different scenarios. And the two red curves here, you know, forget about it, uh, don't worry about the difference between different line types. So the red curves here represent the classical spherical galaxy case. So you can see that this bottleneck around one parsec is there because it depletes the, uh, uh, those uh, radio orbits very quickly in spherical potential. But once you allow the galaxy potential to be non-spherical, you know, like a triaxial or, or even axisymmetric, a spheroidal galaxy, then you find that the, there are enough, there are plenty of orbits that can come close enough to the black hole binary and to shrink it further. And the time it requires to go below this one plastic barrier is actually less than a Hubble time. So that means you can, in principle, uh, get very close uh, pairs of massive black holes so that a gravitational wave radiation can take away. Okay. And I already mentioned the other effects like uh, gas or a third black hole. Uh, will also help uh, uh, eliminate, uh, remedy this, uh, this problem and make it more efficient to form a gravitational wave regime uh, for those uh, this pair of black holes. So where are we going from here? Uh, so I think the best way to go forward is to have a cosmological hydrodynamical simulations to really understand this uh, rich physics of the uh, pair evolution. Both resolution and volume are important. We need a large simulation volume uh, if you want to understand uh, the evolution of the most massive and therefore the rarest uh, population of uh, black holes. But you also need a high resolution because we want to resolve the pair uh, to very small separations, at least to a few parsecs, and uh, that is very challenging. You cannot maintain both high resolution and also a, a large simulation volume. Uh, and uh, a, uh, another note about this is that prescriptions for the simulations, uh, they differ a lot uh, for the detailed recipes for aging fueling, feedback, and uh, even the definitions of aging will vary. This is probably why if you look at the state-of-the-art predictions of the uh, statistics of the agents, uh, use Okay, normalization of those individual uh, uh, predictions of the pair fraction uh, be very uh, taken very seriously. But there are some general trends are probably okay. Uh, for example, the, the increase in trend as a function of redshift uh, for the pair fraction is probably fine. Uh, you do expect that the pairs are uh, more easily triggered as uh, an AGN or a quasar and higher ratio. Surprise to us that we're seeing a kind of a gradual rise of the pair fraction as you go back in time. Okay, so uh, let uh, us jump onto the observational side. So the problem is very challenging uh, for observations, okay? Uh, selectively development have been uh, ahead of, way ahead of observations. And the problem is spatial resolution. So this cartoon here shows the, uh, uh, the uh, approximate size of uh, an AGN uh, or a quasar a creating supermassive black hole. And the top axis shows the uh, physical size and the bottom shows the angular size. So uh, and this uh, uh, circle here shows a sphere of inference, which is about 10 parsecs for a 10 to the 8 solar mass black hole. So in order to resolve a pair of supermassive black holes on kiloparsec or tens of kiloparsec regimes, uh, we need a sub resolution. And that's quite uh, challenging for uh, seeing limited ground-based observations. There's also another reason for that, that is uh, small-scale pairs are rare. Okay, they're not just uh, difficult to find, but they are probably intrinsically rare. And the reason for that is that uh, if you look at ratio two, and look at the larger scale pairs, say tens of kiloparsec scales. So that's easy to identify, right? They are more than a few parsec, uh, a few uh, arc seconds separated. Um, and the fraction is about 0.1% among all the quasars. The double quasar fraction is about 0.1%. Now on those galactic scales, then dynamical friction shrinks the orbit. 
then roughly speaking, the lifetime you spend uh, is, a, a, is proportional to the separation. So T is proportional to R. So we basically expect that if you go down another factor of 10 in scale of separation, then we expect that there is probably about 0.01% of uh, quasars that should be in double quasars, okay? That means that if you survey a sample of 10,000 quasars, you are expecting to find one quasar pair and both of quasars. So that's quite challenging. So the task is uh, uh, easy. So let's just go out there and measure the, uh, the dual quasar fraction as a function, uh, as functions of separation, luminosity and host type and redshift. Okay? And if your statistics are enough, then you can you know, uh, fully understand the dynamics of uh, supermassive uh, in spiral on galactic scales. You can also understand the impact of galaxy mergers on the fielding of those uh, supermassive black holes and triggering them as quasars, and as well as predictions for the abundance of uh, close bound supermassive black hole binaries below 10 parsecs. There must be a systematic survey because uh, we need both statistics and also well quantified completeness. So you need to understand the selection effects that are at play here. Uh, there are more uh, problems. So finding quasar, double quasars, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, finding them uh, is difficult but not impossible. <clears throat> Uh, and traditionally, uh, there have been systematic search for uh, binary quasars. So basically, it's a quasar, the two quasars separated by you know tens of kiloparsec on physical separations. But if you look at the images of those binary quasars, uh, sometimes they are confu they're confusing, ambiguous because a gravitational lens quasar can also produce a an apparent double quasar system. Okay, so. Let's do some uh, uh, detective work here and ask uh, ourselves, uh, is this a quasar pair or is this a lensed, uh, a lensed quasar images? So here is the first example. So I have seen a pair of quasars, the spectral optic spectral of uh, two quasars. Is this a quasar pair or a lensed quasar? Anyone? I would guess it's a lens quasar. Well, uh, yeah, uh, but in fact, this is a quasar pair. And the reason for that is that uh, not only uh, they, do they didn't detect a uh, lens galaxy in between, uh, but also the magnesium two line here uh, looks quite different uh, between these two quasar spectra. So uh, they conclude that this is a quasar pair instead of lens quasar, <clears throat> but it's a close call. All right, so second example here, quasar pair or lens to quasar. I lensed. Okay, yeah, there's a there's an answer on the chat channel. I can see the window here. Uh, and that's correct. This is a lens to quasar <clears throat> because it detects a, a lens galaxy in between the two images. All right, what about, what about this one? This is my last example. So there are actually two quasar spectra overplotted here. They're almost identical. Is this a quasar pair or are these two lensed images? Come on, it's 50-50, anybody? You can either unmute or you can type into the chat window. Pair, I will get a vote of pair. Anybody wants to vote for lensing? Okay, lens. All right, the answer is neither. So this is not a quasar pair, and this is not a lens quasar. Those are two entirely unrated quasars pulled from the Sloan database. Okay, so they are they're separated by hundreds, uh, tens of degrees on the sky. <laughs> so they are from two different, very two different uh, quasars. But their spectra look incredibly similar, right? And you would have imagined that that's probably a lensed quasar because the spectra looks so similar, but no, it's not the case. 
So what I'm trying to say here is that it is often ambiguous to distinguish between those two scenarios, quasar pair lens quasar, uh, and similarity or dissimilarity in the quasar spectra does not guarantee that it is uh, one case or uh, the other. And in fact, if you uh, be really, really um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, picky, then uh, about 10% of the published uh, lens quasars or binary quasars are probably misclassified. Okay. It's just because of the difficulty of the problem. So how do, can we be sure that it is a lens quasar or not? So I think that the, the best way to do that is uh, you really need a very deep infrared imaging so that you can uh, detect the, uh, the lens galaxy in between this pair of images. And the reason that you need the IR imaging is because at higher redshift, the lens galaxy could also be a higher redshift galaxy. So the optical is just not sensitive enough to detect, detect the host light uh, from a higher redshift galaxy. And you also need a high resolution because the, uh, the, for KPC separation pairs, uh, the pair is already separated by, by sub arc second. So you really need diffraction limited resolution in order to be able to see that central potential lens. All right, so in the next 10 minutes or so, uh, I'd like to quickly go through some uh, a project called FODACA, and that stands for fast geometry for of nucleus and dual uh, sub KPC agent. Uh, that's what FODACA means. Um, and I'll explain what a fast geometry means in just a, minute, a second. So our motivation uh, was a few years ago when we started this project was really this present uh, represented by this figure here. So that shows you the, uh, the pair statistics uh, as of a few years ago as a function of uh, redshift and the projected separation. So you can see that uh, once you move to redshift below uh, above 1.5, so sort of in, into the cosmic noon, then there are very few pairs known with separations below 10 kiloparsec. Okay, it's not because uh, there aren't any of those pairs, it's because it's just incredibly difficult to detect them, to, to efficiently target them, and also to follow them up and confirm their uh, dual uh, quasar nature. So our approach is kind of different. So we rely on a technique called bastrometry uh, that stands for variability induced astrometric jitter. So it has variability and it also has astrometry in it. So we create a name called bastrometry here. The basic idea is illustrated by this animation. If you have an unresolved system that contains two supermassive, two AGN or two quasars, and uh, one of them is varying, uh, uh, you know, uh, as a function of time, and as it gets brighter, it will pull the photo center towards it, and, and as it gets fainter, uh, the photo center of this unresolved system uh, will move to the other side. So if you measure the centroid, the photo center of this unresolved system. And you might be able to see this astrometric jitter uh, uh, as a function of time. And this jitter is linear and it is bound, uh, but it is stochastic. So that's unlike orbital motion. The amplitude of this jitter uh, is linearly proportional to the separation of the pair and also the, uh, the uh, fractional uh, variability, RMS variability of uh, this quasar system. Okay, so the more variable this system is, uh, and the larger the separation is, you have a better chance to detect this astrometry uh, jitter. So then we go to Gaia. So Gaia is a, an all-sky astrometric mission to measure precise positions and proper motions, parallaxes for uh, billions of sources. And uh, occasionally you will find that uh, there is a quasar. The Sun spectra shows a pretty nice quasar spectra, right? It's not a star. And somehow the Gaia catalog uh, reports a uh, huge proper motion, uh, like several million arc seconds per year. But apparently that quasar is not moving through space, right? So what we saw, uh, it might be the signature for bastrometry. That is, this is not a single quasar system, but it is an unresolved double quasar system and Gaia Consider uh, uh, mistake mistook it as one, but it tried to measure a astrometric jitter from the variability of that unresolved system. 
So high resolution HST fault up did in reveal that uh, this unresolved system in Gaia indeed turns out to be a double quasar, uh, a double system. Or not, so I said double quasar, let's say a double system. So we don't know yet if the other companion is a quasar or a star. Uh, I should mention that uh, this same technique uh, has been applied to different uh, science cases uh, in the past, uh, come with different names, and we're just uh, you know, uh, rediscovering this technique over and over again. So for binary stars, it's called variability-induced movers of VRM, uh, and for lensed quasars, uh, it is called improper motions. And actually that is, is a very cute name, improper motion. It's proper motion, it's just like proper motion, uh, except it's uh, improper. And for uh, dual quasar agents, uh, that's uh, uh, one paper uh, by Liu et al. Uh, by Liu in 2015 and our uh, project uh, uh, in recent years. So uh, we uh, use the Gaia data to search for uh, uh, systems that could be potentially uh, kiloparticle scale or kinetic scale uh, quasar pairs uh, that is unresolved in Gaia, uh, but somehow Gaia reports. Uh, uh, a very large astrometric jitter uh, that uh, might be indicative of uh, this uh, bus geometry signals. So Xiang Zhu led this uh, HST program uh, uh, several years ago, uh, and this uh, mosaic shows uh, the uh, double system that we have resolved with HST follow-up of uh, candidates selected with Gaia astrometry. Uh, and you can see that the all comes with uh, uh, multiple and double systems uh, and also a uh, very interesting sub arc second uh, quadruply lensed quasar. So it's like, you can see the Einstein ring here. Um, uh, so it's very interesting that uh, the same technique can be used to discover uh, small scale lensed quasars. So if we focus on those objects where Gaia didn't resolve the system, but HST does, uh, and you find that uh, the success rate is actually quite high. So out of 14 targets, uh, we find that six of them actually turn out to be sub arc second and multiples or doubles uh, in HST follow-up. And I just show two examples here where based on those colors, those are composite uh, two-band HST optical colors. You can kind of feel that uh, these two uh, uh, components seems to be both quasars because they look uh, pretty similar in their colors. And indeed, in our follow-up observations, uh, we uh, did confirm that both components of this result pair uh, is uh, a quasar, are, are, are quasars. So this is for one system at ratio of about three, and this is another system at ratio of about 2.2. Uh, and you don't always have the best uh, uh, ground-based scene uh, and give you this nice optical spectroscopy from Gemini. Uh, in some sometimes you will have to rely on uh, uh, radio uh, VLBI imaging to resolve, uh, to uh, reveal the uh, radio emitting cores of these two components. So that it rules out the stars because stars don't emit that much in the radio. All right, the question remains, uh, is it a quasar pair or is it a lens to quasar? I'm so glad that you asked this question, okay? So I believe that, uh, and we believe that uh, the, these systems are, at least some of them, of them are genuine quasar pairs instead of lenses. But those optical images from HST are not sufficient to make that conclusion. We have to go to very deep uh, infrared imaging where here uh, the left panel shows the actual data and uh, when you carefully model the uh, point spread function of those edges images and subtract the model and look at the residual map, then you find that you don't see any evidence for uh, a lens galaxy here. So the contrast here is a little misleading because uh, uh, the, uh, the residual values here are so small that they are much smaller than the required uh, lens galaxy mass. So for this lens to be, uh, uh, to be possible, uh, the residual will have to be much, much brighter, okay? And we also see that there might be some faint tidal features in here, uh, give it or take. Uh, and that's another uh, evidence that uh, this system is actually in a merger system. But you have to go to the infrared in order to this faint uh, extend emission uh, because in the optical, it's just too faint. The starlight is redshift into, uh, uh, into the infrared. 
All right, so this uh, is the same plot uh, and the situation uh, a few years ago. Uh, now with our new approach, uh, we are filling this gap uh, below one arc second or uh, below 10 kiloparsec uh, quite nicely. Uh, and in particular at redshift above 1.5, okay? So those red points are the resolved pairs uh, in our uh, systematic search uh, with vast geometry and follow up. But I should warn you that not all those red points are confirmed double quasars yet, because it, it takes a lot of time to propose for follow up observations and to uh, uh, confirm individually uh, uh, which of those systems are indeed bona fide. Uh, quasar pairs. So we still uh, have lots of follow up data uh, to be analyzed uh, and uh, to be published. Uh, but uh, uh, the hope is that we will have a much uh, clear, much more clear picture uh, of confirmation of uh, those uh, uh, genuine quasar pairs at kiloparsec scales in the next few years. Okay, so let me uh, uh, conclude here. Uh, it's kind of uh, running a little bit late, uh, apologize, uh, I apologize for that. So uh, uh, the main point of my talk is that uh, I want to deliver the message is that the uh, statistics of uh, galactic scale quasar pairs are really key to our understanding of uh, the binary sequence black hole formation uh, and also the interplay between mergers and quasar activity. Um, and I'm pretty confident that in a few years from now, uh, we will have a, a complete observational census of dual quasars and agents at uh, cosmic noon down to this few kiloparsec scales. And possibly we'll also find uh, offset agents. So those are signposts of a, a supermassive black hole pair where only one of them uh, is actively accreting. And by that time, in a few years, hopefully that cosmological hydro simulations uh, would have been uh, mature enough uh, to make head-to-head -head comparisons with our uh, observational statistics. Um, and uh, uh, this comparison uh, between observation and simulations uh, will lead to robust predictions of the pair statistics. And not just for the active subset, but you can kind of bootstrap from the, uh, the, 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 the double quasar fraction to the fraction of uh, uh, all the supermassive hole pairs. And that will test uh, this uh, theoretical predictions of dynamical friction uh, phase, uh, phase uh, of the uh, supermassive hole pair in spiral. If we haven't heard of any news from PT parcel timing arrays about the detection of nanohertz cartesian wave background, uh, I guess that's okay, because uh, by then we should be able to revisit this population-based gravitational wave forecasts based on our observational uh, statistics of pairs uh, at galactic scales as direct input and kind of adjust our uh, predictions of the gravitational wave background and see if they are consistent or not with the latest PTA constraints of non-detection. But hopefully PTA will announce that, oh, is the first detection of gravitational waves from the mergers of those very massive, the most massive uh, supermassive black holes. Okay, so with that, I will stop here. Um, and uh, again, sorry for only leave you a few minutes for the Q and A section. Okay, uh, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, thanks again for this very exciting talk. So it's time for our Q&A session. So if you have any questions, you can either type it you know, in the chat box or just speak up. So uh, let me start one. So I'm just curious. So here uh, you focus on two quasars, right? It means both have to be active, right? So does right. that affect, affect your this new method, this bar astrometry? If only one is turned on, or you know, if or the other one is very weak, or something. Yeah. So at a high ratio, I think you would need uh, that both uh, supermassive black holes to be active, because at a high ratio, uh, if the other black hole is inactive, and the host galaxy is usually too faint. Uh, in the optical to, to be detected by Gaia. So you're, you won't be able to detect any astrometric uh, uh, jitter in the photo center. Uh, so that's why uh, if you look at the high ratio population, 
then uh, this Gaia selection uh, will be restricted to double quasars, uh, the double systems, where you have two bright point sources, and one of them or two of them are quasars that are uh, actually fluctuating in their fluxes. The other one can be a star too. Uh, that's the contamination we want to uh, eliminate. Uh, let me say one more thing about that. At a lower ratio, for example, uh, on the other hand, say ratio below one, then the host light can also contribute in uh, the, uh, the Gaia band, G band. And uh, in that case, uh, this astrometric jitter might also help you to constrain the offset of uh, the, uh, the, the, the quasar point source uh, and the, uh, the, cent the centroid of that host galaxy. So that's actually, we did a paper on that uh, and use the astrometric noise trying to constrain the, uh, the typical, the average uh, offset of AGNs from the center of the galaxy in low redshift systems. So that also means the rate you determine using double quasars. So it's just like lower limit for if you're going to estimate the double supermassive black holes. Yeah, so this is a, uh, of course, it's a very important question. We can only see a, a systematically fine uh, double quasars, right? But what we're uh, uh, really interested in is a fraction of double supermassive black holes. So you need to understand, you need to know the duty cycle of quasar activity. That is, uh, what is the uh, fraction of a supermassive black hole being active, right? And apparently that duty cycle depends on the luminosity threshold they use in defining a quasar. And also it depends on the pair separation uh, because as the merger goes on, uh, at a smaller and smaller separation, the duty cycle of a uh, black hole being active is probably enhanced because that's the final stage of the merger. So what we're trying to do here is to use observed double quasar fraction and combine with uh, theoretical predictions from uh, numerical simulations, kind of a bootstrap from that to predict the, the intrinsic pair uh, fraction for all the supermassive black hole pairs, not just the one that both component, components are active. Uh, but uh, this is just the first step. I think by measuring the, uh, the double quasar fraction as a function of separation, it tells a lot. It not only tells you the, 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 the population, uh, the fraction of uh, uh, all the submissive pairs, but also how the duty cycle is increased towards smaller and smaller separations. So that's, that is why uh, I think it's important and critical to combine uh, both observations. And uh, hydro cosmological hydro simulations. Okay, that's great. Okay, so we have some. I, I can see someone raise his hand. So, Chi Hong, right? Okay, so uh, good morning, Professor. That has a uh, one question. Is uh, so we know on uh, different black hole, it might be as a difference the uh, rotate direction. So my question is uh, so if two black hole merge, why is a uh, rotate from right to left? Why is it uh, from left to right? And as we know the depth, the rotation of the direction of the depth, they will be same for the black hole. So when it's a two different uh, uh, direction, rotate, rotate directions, the black hole and their depth merge to each other. Before the black hole to touch each other, the depth will be touch another depth too. So, be, so what happens when there's a two depths they um, bind to each other, will they produce the very large uh, fraction keys or light or something. So this is uh, my question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's possible if uh, if if those so-called disks can survive on such small separations. So when we talk about the final merging stage of the two black holes, we're talking about uh, uh, you know much much less than one milliparsec, right? Uh, so uh, my intuition is that, well, of course, there are uh, theoretical uh, theorists who have uh, done more serious working on this, is that when the two pairs are so close to each other, then they are probably uh, uh, would only maintain tiny mini disks around them. Uh, and then outside this binary orbit, you probably uh, also have an additional circumbinary disk, okay? But if those two, uh, those two mini disks do collide with each other, and as you say, if the spin uh, direction of the two blocks are different or aligned or misaligned, uh, then yes, the interaction of uh, these two mini disks uh, would potentially lead to some observable EM signatures or even leave a print on the, uh, uh, on the gravitational waveform. Uh, 
uh, during those last uh, stage of, of the evolution. Okay, Does thank that you. answer your question? Yeah, thank you, Professor. Okay. Uh, Yiquan, you want to speak up? Sure. Uh, thanks for the very interesting talk. And so you showed us that perhaps the, the best way to distinguish whether the system is uh, physically associated double quasars or um, lensed quasars is uh, near infrared imaging, high resolution near infrared imaging. But I was wondering, uh, because the initial selection is related to um, variability of the quasars, and then I would imagine that if there's a gravitationally lensed double quasar with the sim, uh, like small flux ratio, then there, there is this distinct signatures of time delay. Uh, and then the, the intrinsic uh, light curve of the two images is actually the same, but with, with some time delay. And then, so I was wondering if there's a way to uh, either confirm the system is double quasars or, or lens quasars by very good uh, time variability uh, information. So if that's the case, how good the time series data has to be to distinguish these two scenario? Yeah, uh, so this is a this is a great question. Uh, so in fact, I think there are several papers out there uh, proposing that you can uh, you can identify gravitational lens quasars unresolved uh, based on very high cadence light curves. Uh, because of the time delay, then the light curve is actually of this unresolved multiple images is a mixture of uh, two sets of multiple sets of the same light curve just shifted by the time delay, right? So if you do the autocorrelation function, then you would potentially be able to uh, measure the time delay, uh, the gravitational lensing delay, uh, that it will allow you to confirm that it is, it is a gravitational lens quasar. However, again, in order to make that measurement, uh, you have to uh, keep in mind that quasars vary all the time. You know, the quasar variability is stochastic. Um, so there are uh, a lot of false positives uh, you can potentially detect. Uh, in the autocorrelation function. Uh, and for uh, people like me who spend a lot of time thinking about variability of quasars and measuring time lags, you know, I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit concerned that uh, even with high cadence uh, optical light curves from say the daily cadence or maybe twice uh, 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 once uh, per two days cadence from the SST uh, deep drill fields, uh, you are probably still going to be facing those problems uh, with uh, aliases uh, and ambiguities of the autocorrelation function. So I, I, I think that's a, a direction that we should certainly uh, try to try to do, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it could be complementary uh, uh, to other uh, methods like detecting the the lensing with a, a very high resolution uh, IR imaging. But okay. Yes, I agree. Okay. It's a good point. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ding Wen. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I, this is just a short question. I just wonder, you mentioned uh, six out of 14 are actually detected as like a double sources. I just wonder how about the rest of the eight? Uh, right. So, uh, 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 so the rest of the eight, it turns out to be a single system. Um, so uh, the selection of astrometry uh, based on Gaia is we're using a quantity called um, uh, uh, extrometric excess noise, uh, which is equivalent to uh, some additional uh, noise term that cannot be uh, accounted for with uh, known systematics of Gaia uh, and other astronomical uh, effects. Uh, but it's possible that that uh, the uh, this astro, uh, astro, astrometric uh, excess noise contains some unknown systematics uh, that is misinterpreted as misobserved as the uh, uh, the actual astronomical signal. So for those uh, systems, uh, the single systems, the HST, it is possible that uh, it's a pair that is even below the HST resolution. So if, if the pair separation is say below 0.1 second, then even HST is, is unable to resolve. So that's one possibility. We do see a case where 
uh, the the system seems to be marginally resolved by HST, kind of uh, uh, separations like uh, uh, around 0.1 arc second. So that's that's one possibility. Uh, of course, the other possibility is that we're just seeing unknown systematics of, of Gaia. Uh, indeed, uh, when we look at uh, uh, Gaia DR3, uh, compared with the Gaia DR2, which those objects were selected, we found that a lot of those signals uh, went away in Gaia DR3. So with better and better Gaia data releases, I think we will refine uh, and uh, have a, a higher purity of the selection. Thanks. Cool. Okay, any more questions? Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, it's really inspiring. My problem is like which stage or what's the nearest distance we can find that we have like found so far by like binary black hole system. Like we know the closer it is, the later stage it is in. And we want to know like the binary system with like gravitational radiation or even like different uh, inference of the galactic system or AGN system. So I, I'm not sure, like KPC, or have we gone like like smaller scales of like binary system to know the angular momentum or something like like yeah. so. Inference. So there is a huge community out there trying to discover and identify close supermassive black hole pairs. Uh, kind of in the uh, parsec region, below 10 parsec region. So that's where the two black holes become gravitationally bound to each other, right? Uh, I will give you the answer here. So there's no confirmed case of, uh, 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 of bound supermassive black hole pairs, except for one, which is uh, a uh, system, low redshift system where there are uh, detection of two radio cores separated by a projected seven parsec. Uh, uh, separation. Uh, and uh, that is a serendipitous discovery system. But that is only one uh, that we know for sure that is, is spatially resolved. And the separation is seven parsec. So it's not yet quite yet in the uh, in the final parsec regime yet. But you can argue that this is a, 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 probably a, 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 a gravitational bound uh, black hole binary. But other than that, we don't have other uh, information about the uh, the mass of the two black holes, because in the optical, just don't resolve them. You only resolve the radio emission with the VL, uh, VLBI. Uh, but in order to measure black hole mass, uh, you, in either you can monitor the orbiter of those two, which will take like uh, decades, or at least decades, or you, you have optical uh, observation to resolve those systems, but you just don't resolve them spatially. There are lots of candidates. Uh, and in fact, uh, they probably publish candidate uh, binary black holes like once every several months or something. Um, but those are not confirmed. Uh, They're based on different uh, select, uh, different arguments. For example, periodicities in the light curves or the broad emission lines kind of show this periodic, not periodic, show double peak profile. Uh, and it's incredibly difficult to, to confirm their binary nature uh, uh, because uh, there are alternative explanation uh, scenarios that can also explain uh, those uh, particular features. So I would say that uh, I actually uh, open to the idea to continue exploring those alternative indirect methods. That is, you, you, you uh, indirectly infer a, a binary black hole system and then you follow them up, uh, you keep monitoring them, uh, and maybe eventually you will be convinced that uh, this is indeed a, a, a binary uh, supermassive black hole. Okay. okay. So at Thank this you. point, I don't, I don't think there's any confirmed case uh, you know, below the, uh, the parsec region. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? So one last question from me. So um, if so if we have unresolved uh, Gaia candidates, so but we but what if we don't have uh, if we don't have a high resolution imaging from like Hubble Space Telescope, can we use high resolution spectroscopy to you know to tell if it's a double quasars? Uh, yes, and I, I think high resolution spectroscopy is even better because uh, you know if you only have imaging, then the resolved a companion could still be a star. So if you have spectroscopy um, uh, to confirm, like we did for uh, with the Gemini uh, spectroscopy, uh, then not only you resolve the system, but also uh, you uh, uh, you know you know the uh, uh, you know the nature of that system. 
The problem is that you don't, uh, you, you cannot use like slit spectroscopy because you don't know where that object is before you actually have resolved images, right? But if you have uh, like high resolution eye view data, then of course you can you can see that. And it's probably even better because the eye view data gives you all the information there. And if it's deep enough in the infrared, then maybe you, you, you will be able to see tidal features. That's another uh, uh, kind of um, uh, strong evidence uh, that this is a merger uh, and therefore a, a binary uh, dual a pair system. Yeah, sounds great. Okay. Yeah, um, any more questions from the audience? Not, I think. Uh... That would be the end of this talk. Uh, thanks, Professor Shen, again for uh, staying with us and giving this exciting talk. Uh, and thanks all the audience again for participating. So I believe this is the end of this monthly online talk series. You are the last speaker of this uh, NCU Delta series. So I think this has been successful and you know, there have been so many nice interactions and discussions. So I think, yeah, that's very nice. So I think that's it for today's talk. And I hope to see you again at some point, okay? Me too. And I should say that um, I'm, I'm very happy that uh, uh, you know, I can give this talk. Uh, and uh, thank you all for the, uh, for the participation and also for the excellent questions. Uh, I, I, from, I can see it from a lot of the uh, uh, young scholars. Uh, so it shows that uh, you guys are very active. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, uh, Charles, yes, uh, I, I can promise uh, that, uh, but we are working on that. <laughs> <laughs> right. You will see me more stressed, you know. <laughs> but Great. yeah, that's uh... Okay, thanks everyone again. Yeah, I'll see you next time, bye. Thank you. Thank you all, yeah. Okay, yeah. bye. Bye. bye.